All right, welcome back. Now we've got Aaron Coolish joining us, and we've got that audio issue fixed. And Eric, now we can go ahead and talk about it. The reshuffling at DHL, we're starting with news about the people as we had a shuffle of CEOs of DHL Express. Give us a little bit of an update about what happened. Right, uh, DHL Express, uh, one of the big three integrators along with uh, UPS and FedEx, they uh, shuffled around their top man regional management with Mike Parra, the CEO of the Americas, going over to Europe. The uh, European CEO had left in the summer uh, for to pursue other opportunities. He's now the head of some uh, rail logistics company in Europe. So there was an opening there. They moved uh, Mr. Parra to Europe. Uh, the Canadian uh, CEO is now uh, the head of Canada, DHL Express, is going to move down as of uh, January 1st to take over the Americas region. So he'll kind of uh, oversee Canada, the U.S., and uh, Latin America. Eric, we really haven't had too much in terms of DHL in the headlines. And I remember not too long ago, we had uh, Mark Solomon on kind of gauging out the big three, of course, FedEx and UPS there as well, making that discussion across the board uh, and saying DHL was probably in the best situation to kind of handle these economic downturns that we've that, that we've been having in, in this freight recession. Uh, given the space in the air cargo industry right now, right now, given these changes as way, well, is DHL still perhaps the lead in terms of in, in just being ready for this kind of, uh, of an environment and what they're doing? You know, I, it's, it's hard to say. I haven't uh, done a across-the-board comparison of the three integrators, but, you know, it, it seems at the surface level that DHL is, um, you know, doing a little better or, or hasn't, um, you know, felt the same level of um, downturn or, or, you know, loss of revenue maybe that uh, FedEx and UPS have. Uh, we haven't you know, they're obviously cutting back some on some of their flights or, you know, some of their in-network to a certain degree, but not to the same extent that UPS and FedEx are parking planes and, you know, outsourcing more flying or, you know, um, doing other kinds of infrastructure uh, downsizing. So, um, you know, on the margins, I think, um, you know, DHL's kind of trying to cut some expenses, but, you know, overall, they're seems like their air freight at least is is doing relatively well in this down market especially in the fourth quarter so eric with this administrative shuffle we have a whole left at dhl express the ceo role in canada any indication on who's going to fill it or if it's going to just be open now for a while yeah they didn't announce who the um, you know the succession there yet so i'm not sure so then moving on, you've got another issue, again, DHL being kind of on top of things and diverting flights away from Cincinnati as well from a possible strike that may happen there as well. Can you fill us in there? Yeah, this is uh, very interesting in news. The uh, Cincinnati Northern Kentucky Airport is the one of three super hubs in the DHL global network, uh, along with Hong Kong and uh, I believe Cologne, Bonn Airport and so in Germany. So they're um, they're look, they're staring at the, in the, at a potential strike there in the coming days, where their aircraft come in and the, you know they have to sort operations overnight and then the planes go out um, for packages. So the ramp workers there, about 1,100 ramp workers that do the plane handling and loading and unloading, they've uh, authorized their union, the Teamsters to um, to call a strike if and when they decide that their labor negotiations have stalled and aren't going well. So, you know, that's putting, that's an attempt to put pressure on the company and, you know, leaves open the possibility of a strike. So, um, you know, this union was just formed back in April. It's relatively new. They got organized and DHL is responding already. They're not taking any chances. They're hiring or bringing in temporary workers or per training up some of their executives to uh, work those shifts and also have diverted, already started diverting flights to some of their other uh, regional hubs to not get caught, uh, you know, with any disruptions. 
So as you mentioned, this union is fairly new, formed at the end of the summer, and they're collective bargaining for their first agreement right now. And a lot of what they're pointing out, what you've written in your story, are safety concerns. And we know that we saw, of course, during the air freight boom, a lot of these smaller airports or cargo airports really investing in some of their infrastructure, investing in new technology or safety operations to protect their workers. Was Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky unable to do some of that same investment? And is that why we're seeing now these union members really kind of fight for what seems pretty simple, right? Lighting, faded striping, things with windshield wipers. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, this is independent from in the airport, in, you know, investment. <clears throat> this is just, uh, you know, allegedly a DHL lack of investment in safety. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to gauge, you know, who's right here. And but these are the the Teamster unions claims that the workers have, uh, you know, have to endure these unsafe conditions. There have been 22 supposed alleged um, hospitalizations or serious injuries um, in the past year where workers have been hurt on the job and you know some of the safety issues include you know poor lighting at night the workers supposedly have to use their cell phone lights or buy their own headlamps if they want some extra lighting so they can see better and uh, just other you know lack of maintenance of the tugs that pull around the containers or the pallets on the tarmac so there's that and then there's also complaints so labor you know restraint complaints where you know the union says dhl is trying to discourage or intimidate their unionizing efforts uh, either surveilling workers off-site or trying to scare them that they might lose their jobs if they meet with union uh, leadership um, and other harassing tactics designed to you know interfere with them trying to this, some of these claims are when they were trying to actually organize a union but i think some of the concerns are that uh, some of these tactics are still going on and so they filed uh, complaints with the National Labor Relations Board, which is looking into it. So, Eric, we got about a minute left here. In terms of uh, obviously, one of the reasons to unionize is to be able to strike and maybe have that opportunistic uh, ability to do that there as well. Given what DHL has done here, <coughs> do we have an idea of perhaps a timeline? In other words, did they move um, planes away because they thought that a strike might be imminent, or is this more or less a negotiation tactic saying, look, we're going to outrun yeah. you no matter which way you go. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I guess, you know, now's the peak season for shipping, or, you know, ahead of the holidays. So, you know, on the one hand, you would think a strike, there might be some leverage to go soon, but who knows on the timing, but I guess DHL is not going to wait around or get caught with its pants down. So they're, they've taken some, uh, implemented some contingency plans. I would say that this is a, uh, you know, been a strong year for unions uh, with the UAW getting a big contract from the auto manufacturers. The Teamsters also getting a big win from UPS. Yes, um, I just saw today the Washington Post uh, media uh, editorial or press team went on a one-day strike. Uh, they're not happy with their negotiations. So um, it's been a it's been a good you know some of the um, conditions are right for unions to do better this uh, than they have in the past. Absolutely, and that's one of the big stories that we've talked about all year here on Freight Waves. Eric, thank you for joining us this morning, and we'll talk to you soon. Anytime.